We have a lot of the components necessary to prove spherics regularity theorem for differential inclusions, which is, um, in a sense, uh, quite a far-reaching generalization of the first theorem of complex analysis. Um, so let's state it. So theorem. And this is, I think, from 93, I suppose. K is contained within 2 by 2, connected. No R1 connections, rank 1 connections. Elliptic, which I'll explain what it means in a second. Well, it's right down, so no R1 connections in tangent space. And I should have said that plus K is a submanifold. So we actually have tangent space everywhere. Okay. Then, if we have a Lipschitz function, so if uh, u, which is a Lipschitz function from omega into R2, is such that gradient belongs to K almost everywhere, then the gradient's going to be as smooth as K is. So the first step, just from these hypotheses, um, or the first thing we'll be able to conclude, is that uh, the gradient's actually holder. This is probably the last theorem we're going to prove, but we'll prove some theorems uh, necessary to complete this next week, or at least one theorem, hopefully. All right, so what is this saying? So we have a submanifold K inside two by two matrices. And if we take its tangent space, then that is just some linear subspace of some dimension whatever the dimension is, inside the space of submanifolds. Uh, sorry, yeah, inside the, <laughs> inside the space of two by two matrices. And that thing has to have no rank one connections itself, right? So think of the space of things that, have, that are rank one and two by two. Those are the set of things which the determinant is equal to zero, right? And that thing forms a cone, because if you take any lambda of a matrix is determined to zero, it scales, right? So we have a, a cone emanating out from, from zero. It's the set of things that solve a polynomial equation. Of, so therefore, it's going to be a cone of dimension three. Yeah? And we have that every single tangent space is only intersecting that cone at zero. Note, if tangent space Let's call it T of M uh, for M inside our set K has no R1 connections. Then If A, B belongs to T, determinant of A minus B is bigger than zero, but A minus B is in T as well, so we have that determinant lowercase of any of these guys. A is 
or at least it's not necessarily bigger than zero, but it's not equal to zero. It's not equal to zero for any A belonging to the tangent space. Yeah. Cool, so that has strong implications, as we'll see. So first thing to note is that the set K itself, the submanifold K itself, doesn't have any rank one connections. So we also know that determinant of A minus B is not equal to zero for any a b belonging to the set k. Right? Because if it did, that would be a rank one connection in set k. And since k is a connected thing, then it's a topological fact that we must have that either a minus b is always going to be positive or a minus b is always going to be negative as we range a be across all possible pairs. And that's something that, that I guess Hyogo and, and, and uh, 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 Sasanka are going to talk about because that's also part of the theorem that they're going to prove. So, topological fact. I don't know how to spell that. So, topology, top. Since K is connected, we have that either that of A minus B is bigger than zero for all A, B belong to K, or Minus B, zero for all A comma B belong to K. Yeah. But then that gives us something, well, that gives us the potential to do something a little bit stronger. So let's assume that we have one or the other one of these. So we're going to, let's just assume we have this guy. So Assume the former. Let's call that star. Claim that this actually means that we have determinant of the difference is bounded below by. constant times a minus b squared. Or a comma b belong to k. Okay, so why should we expect this? Well, um, so if this is always positive, this is a polynomial function of, of uh, a and b, you know, where a and b range over k. Yeah. If, for example, k was analytic, then we would expect there to be some sort of a power of, in terms of how much this thing can decay as we let, for example, b approach a. Because yeah. this will be related to um, this will be related to how much or how close this thing is getting towards the the rank one cone. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so the yeah um, yeah. I, mean, I guess we're going to see this just from the calculation. So this is how we can see this. So proof. No. Uh, I'm not assuming K is compact, um, but I am taking a Lipschitz function. So, so K can be some set which is which is which is non-compact, unbounded, but 
every u that I'm applying this to is only going to take values inside some bounded subset of k. Yeah. Um, so, proof. Um, yeah, as you know, implicit in, in Yogo's question is, is that we only have to care about proving this inequality for a and b pretty close together because we know that for any a and b which are not close together, we have that this is definitely true you know, for, some, for some constant. So if we were to take a compact subset of our set k and, and minimize uh, over that a minus b for all a, b inside that compact subset where a and b have some definite distance delta apart, then the minimum of that thing would have to be bigger than zero because otherwise by compactness we would have a rank one connection. You know, and that's a bunch of words, but did that sort of make sense? So let me write that down. We only care, or we only need to show for A close to B because if um, S, oh no, let's do it this way. If R is bigger than zero, let, um, let, let, let Q of delta uh, be the inf of the determinant of A minus B. Yeah. Where A, B belongs to K in the second ball of radius R around zero and A minus B is bigger than delta. I claim that this thing has to be a strictly positive number. And the argument is that if that's not true, then let's just take our sequence a n b n, where a n minus b n is strictly bigger than delta, and take that infimum which takes us down to zero, then, then, then since this is a compact set, now we can pass the limit, we'll have limiting a tilde, b tilde inside k, still some distance apart, but then by continuity, the determinant of a tilde minus b tilde will be zero, and therefore we'll have a rank one connection in k. I think implicit in that is that we are closed. Yeah, okay. Cool. So everybody agree that this thing is definitely bigger than zero. Yeah. Thumbs up if so. Thumbs down if not. Now we'll just talk more about it. Is that a thumbs down? I can't really see. It's a thumbs up. All right. Cool. All right. So this is some positive thing. So then by compactness. We have that Q uh, of delta is bigger than zero. For every uh, bigger than zero, delta bigger than zero. Yeah. So if we can show some some estimate like this for for all a uh, minus b inside some compact subset of K for which A minus B is less than some particular number, doesn't matter how small, then that's all we care about because for all the A minus B which are bigger than that number, there is this constant here. Yeah? There is this constant here and therefore we still have this we still have this inequality just because for a minus b, which is bigger than this delta, then determinant of a minus b is bigger than this constant, which will be bigger than 
uh, a minus b squared because a minus b squared is some bounded number, right? If we put the right small constant here. All right, so this, this thing needs to be shown when we consider a minus b to be arbitrarily small and we want to have a uniform bound for any choice of a and b inside some compact subset uh, where the uniformity has, it has to be uniform with respect to the, to the, to the smallness of a minus b. But if we can show that, then we're all set. Yeah, we're all set. So that's what we're going to show using the hypothesis that we don't have any rank one connections in the, in the tangent space. Okay. Okay. So proof of claim. Continued. So we only care about a minus b, which is small. So suppose for some uh, uh, that's just I mean, so I mean, if this was a false thing, and we could find some sequence a k b k that tend towards, uh, whose difference tends towards zero. Uh, okay, let me just write that out. So suppose for some a k, b k, belonging to k with a k minus b k going to zero, we have, I should say, inside some compact subset of this, so for some capital R, we have that this is false, that uh, uh, that we are not controlling the determinant. So determinant of AK minus BK is, say, uh, oh, uh, is less than 2 to the minus k of ak minus k squared. Um, right? So if, that, if the statement is false, then we have a, a, a sequence for which we're not controlling ak minus bk by the determinant. Right? I'm hoping I put the inequalities the right way around. So, <laughs> so then AK, so up to a subsequence AK is converging to some limit BK, so. Take a subsequence not relabeled. So this is a common thing you'll see as you read more math that people don't relabel subsequences. such that AK tends towards some limiting A, right? Then by continuity, what we're going to have is that this will be false. Uh, this will be false. Or it will be false that the tangent space at A will have no rank connections. So let's see it this way. Then note that we can just divide both sides of this by a k minus b k squared. Right? So we have determinant of a k minus b k over the norm a k minus b k squared is less than 2 to the minus k, like this. But then consider this matrix, let's call it mk, which is ak minus bk over 
bk minus bk like this, yeah? And then the determinant of this mk is just this quantity, right? Because the determinant is a two by two determinant, we can pull out this thing. So this thing is actually less than two to the minus k. It's also um, bigger than zero because that's our initial assumption that for any a k, b k inside, well, that's, we either have it's positive or it's negative for all a k, b k, which are different inside k by the topological thing. And we are assuming that we have we have zero if it was negative. We have it's bigger than equal to zero. If it was less than equal to zero, we'd do everything the same, but with just inequalities going the other way around. Yeah. So then we have this is true. Yeah. But then what's this? This is a sequence of matrices whose Hilbert-Smith norm is one. Right. So this is a bounded sequence of matrices. Yeah. So again, passing to a subsequence. So. We have that. And k will tend towards m for some m. Yeah, so so this is this is what I'm gonna sort of introducing now is the convention of passing to a subsequence without writing the subsequence. Oh, why does this thing not leave k? This thing, this thing, um, so uh, it's not about the, the AK minus BK are in K. They are not in K, but AK and BK are in K. Yeah? Oh, I see your, I, maybe that's your, yeah. So, so is your issue, why do I know this? Because, okay. So this thing is nothing other than the determinant of AK minus, okay, and A, and AK and BK are both in Ks, so, so their determinant is, yeah. Right. Okay, thank you for the question. I see, I see why, why that gave you pause. Cool, everybody with me here, yeah? So we have that MK is tending towards some M, yeah? For some M, which is just some two by two matrix, yeah? But then by continuity, so determinant is a, polynomial function of the coordinates is definitely continuous. So determinant of m equals zero. So m is rank one. Yeah? Cool. Now, tell me other things about m. So let's draw a picture. We have these a, k, b, k getting closer and closer together, right? Yeah. This M on this picture, what is it? It is the difference between them divided by the size of the difference between them. So it's, think of this as this vector, right? So this is this M and K vector in the sense of vector in the space of two by two matrices. Yeah? Why are we looking at a contradiction here of A, right? Because as AK as k tends towards infinity, a k is tending towards a, and therefore this guy is tending towards the, this tie is gonna be a vector which will tend towards the tangent space of a, wherever it is. So if this is the tangent space of a, then I guess that means that we actually need that the tangent spaces are continuous. We need that the tangent spaces are continuous. So it's at least a C1 submanifold. Yeah, uh, so if we have higher regularity with the manifold, so if we, can, if we can do a Taylor expansion, then for sure we can estimate the difference between the partial quotient and the actual tangent space. So it's gonna get closer and closer to the tangent space. And then if tangent spaces are continuous, then, then that will do the result. Geometrically, it seems kind of clear to us that the limit of this, of these vectors mk will be in the tangent space if we have a smooth enough submanifold. So uh, ho hopefully it, it, it seems reasonable and, and uh, you can believe me on this. And to be shown,
m belongs to t of m, the tangent space, uh, t of a, the tangent space. A. So, contradiction. Contra. Contradiction. Thus, we have this estimate, modulo this this one point. <clears throat> so, claim is established. All right. So. Why is this useful? Well, the, um, the really cool fact about determinants that we've used, or determinants acting on gradients, is that determinants can be written as divergence. Yeah? And divergence, uh, divergences are things that we like to test against test functions because we can put the gradient on the other side and have the gradient be on the test function and have the convergence of the actual function take care of Take care of, <laughs> take care of the convergence, and then we can t integrate by parts and put the gradient back. That's why determinants behave well with weak convergence. Right? This is something we've seen. So let me write down what I'm saying. So, so recall. Recall that determinant of the u which as you go is 1 comma 1, 2 comma 2, 1 u, 2 comma 1. This is the same as the divergence of this thing and then this thing. Right, we've seen this a couple of times, yeah? Just, just take this, take the divergence through, It'll hit this guy, it'll hit this guy over the first partial, second partial will hit this guy, which gives us that, and then hit this guy, and we'll get a cancellation of, of, of these terms. Yeah? Are you okay? Should I write that out again? Everybody okay? Yeah? So this was magic for us, or this was very strong for us, because it allowed us to, to, to do this, that if we had a, a sequence, so if we have a sequence that converges weakly in Sobolev space, so if UK converges weakly in Sobolev space to U, so the gradients converge weakly, then we can test this gradient with a test function and then write it in divergence form and put the gradient on this guy, and then we'll have convergence of these things inside, which is easy to deal with because this thing will converge weakly and these guys here converge strongly and we can make it work, right? So this thing allowed us to do this and to show the determinants are these things that behave well with weak convergence. And then in fact, the only nonlinear function that behaves well with weak convergence when we act on gradients. Right? And if you have arbitrary functions, then nothing behaves well with respect to weak convergence except except affine functions, right? So we're going to use the same idea, um, except now we're going to use it in the elliptic regularity context. And you remember in the elliptic regularity, uh, our cool trick was to be able to control the higher gradients by the lower gradients, yeah? by this Cacipoli type inequality. Yeah? And that is what this, this structure is going to allow us to do. This thing is going to allow us to, to control the higher gradients by the lower gradients because we can, we, can, we can express this thing as, as a divergence. So this is how this trick is going to work. So take some k belonging to 1, 2. So we're going to take some partial derivative. And we're going to define uh of x to be u of x plus h e k minus u of x over h, like this, okay? So if we take the gradient of this guy, then it's the gradient of this, 
Oops. Like this, yeah? Uh, that's a H, the superscript here. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree the K is uh, <laughs> looks very much like, okay, let's choose M. So we're gonna like just do this, like we're gonna not have to deal with the direction much because it's not important, like this. Yeah, like this, cool. So what do we know about this? Well, if we take the determinant of this thing, Okay, so I'm just going to write it first, and then we'll see how, how we use this. Since these guys are inside our set K, yeah, so this will be equal to H to the minus 2, the determinant of this difference, the U of X plus H E K minus the U of X. Right, and by the bound that we've established, this thing will control h to the minus 2 of actually this difference. Oops, this is m. Okay. Yeah. Which is great for us because we are going to consider... expressions like this. So we're going to consider the integral of the determinant of, oh, oh, I think that was your question, right? So why <laughs> this superscript should not, well, maybe it wasn't your question, but this superscript should not be there. It should be there. Yeah. So consider the determinant of d of u, this thing of x, times some compactly supported test function. Yeah? Um, so let's put brackets around this. So we're taking the gradient of this u of h, this partial quotient, times some compactly supported test function, like this. And this is the gradient of, overall, a compactly supported test function, or compactly supported function, right? So then this thing will actually be 0. Yeah? But when we break up this thing, it'll have the determinant hitting this thing and then the determinant hitting the test function. Yeah. And then we'll be able to control the part where the determinant hits the actual uh with the part where it's the uh times the determinant uh, times the derivative hitting phi. And exactly the same way we did with the Takachi Poli inequality. Yeah. None of that stuff would be any use unless we could control the determinant uh, of the gradient of uh in terms of something that controls the absolute size of the difference between between the gradient at uh, uh, the gradient at u uh, of x plus uh, <laughs> h e m minus u of x, right? So this thing is an absolutely key step because unless we could control this thing in terms of this thing, then it's no use being able to control this thing. Because ultimately we want to control the difference between these guys right here, yeah, by lower order terms. So, so the, the uh, well, it's inside this determinant, so we're taking the gradient of this whole thing here. So I'm going to write this out in detail in a second, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm trying to like motivate for why, why we care about this inequality. But yeah, go ahead. So if it is like in this form, where we have, so we're taking the derivative of the function uh, this difference quotient, times phi, you know, which is compactly supported, you know, and just by the product rule, that will involve a derivative acting on the difference quotient, and it will involve the difference quotient times the derivative acting on, on phi, you know, you know, and the big point is that, therefore, we can control the determinant of the derivative on the difference quotient by the other term, which is just the difference quotient times the derivative on phi, determinant of that thing, yeah? And that's, and, and that's, and that's very analogous to, to, to what we did in elliptic regularity. So it's, 
this proof is very much inspired by, by this classic method of integrated uh, I didn't wear my watch, so I fear I'm already running out of time. How, how are we for time? What's the time now? 11 8, okay. Much slower than I expected, but my fault. All right, I want to at least put the basic inequality. So, for phi, which is compactly supported, in omega, then the integral of the determinant of the gradient of uh times phi dx equals zero by divergence theorem. Yeah. And of omega. And so determinant of d of h phi of phi is determinant of d u h of phi plus u h d of phi, like this. And then we use this determinant formula that I stated before. So. This is a surprisingly useful formula. Ah, a surprisingly useful formula, and I wrote it in a really stupid way. Okay. This is a bit of linear algebra. You can just directly check it. It's two by two matrices. It's not to a uh, longer calculation. So an important point is definitely not to think that the term of A plus B is linear. I mean, it's a highly nonlinear thing, but in two by two, it happens that we have a fairly neat expression for it. So let's apply that. So we have determinant of du of H phi plus the cofactor of U H D phi plus the determinant of u h d phi like this. Yeah? And the integral of all of that stuff, all these three terms is all is equal to zero. So the natural thing for us to do is to try and control this thing by the lower order terms. Yeah? Since we're in two by two, this thing here is a perfectly nice linear thing. Right? The cofactor matrix is a, is a, is a, is a, uh, is a linear function of the matrix itself because yeah, we're just changing around the entries. Yeah. So, uh, from, let's call this thing star. So from star, what we know, we know that the integral of the determinant of duh of phi dx is less than equal to these other things. So the absolute value of the cofactor of du h like this, of phi like this, dot product u h d of phi, absolute value plus the determinant of u h d phi like this, right? And then this thing we are going to bound just by, so we can put everything over omega, but uh, yeah, compact the supported test function in omega, so it's clear that's what we're integrating over. So anyway, let's look at this thing. This guy here, we can just apply Cauchy-Schwarz to, so then this is less than the integral of omega of the cofactor of the u h of phi squared dx, one over two, and then, uh, 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 yeah, I don't care about that. So then this thing, omega u h d phi like this squared one over two and then this term right here uh, and actually this term is even simpler because this is this 
Um, so when we do the derivative of this guy, then what is this? This is a vector valued function, this is a scalar valued function. So when we take the derivative of this, the first term is this two by two matrix given by the derivative completely hitting this, this, uh, this vector value function u. And the second term is this vector value function u tensor product with the gradient of phi. So this is the tensor product of these two, two vectors, which produces the matrix of the gradient. Yeah? So this thing is actually zero, so we don't even care about it. This is a rank one matrix. Right, so um, over time, but this is a little, little calculation. Maybe just should we do this? Yeah, let's do it. So u h of phi is u h one, u h two of phi. Right. So then, if we take the gradient and we are acting on the phi, right. So let's write it like this. This is u. 1h phi u2 h phi. And if the gradient's acting on the phi, then the two by two matrix we get will be, um, so the first row will be, the first column of the matrix will be the partial uh, x acting on this guy and the partial x acting on this guy. And the second will be the partial y acting on this guy and the partial y acting on this guy. So, um, so, so yeah, uh, that, that will produce that. I don't know if that's helpful. Okay, so I feel like I have to either do that in complete detail or not talk about it all. All right, so let's just do it. So, um, and then this thing itself is just a, a rank one matrix given by U H cross product, the gradient of phi. Right, because you know this is this thing we learned a one b one a one b two a two b one a two b two right this is the standard form for a rank one matrix and that's exactly the form that we have here so the first coordinate uh, uh, except I'm such an idiot I'm still messing this up so so it's actually this. Yeah, all I'm trying to show is this form so that we know it's a rank one matrix so that this is zero. Yeah, but that would mean the integral is zero, but that's not the point. The point is that this is pointwise zero at every single x, this, this, yeah. Yeah. And since this thing is, is a rank one matrix just from this calculation, then I can just kill it. I can just say this goes away like this. Yeah, so do you agree that if this is a rank one matrix, then for sure the determinant is zero, yeah? Yeah, yeah, check it out for yourself, but I, I don't think there's any way to just, you know, I mean, it's not a big step uh, to, 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 to get rid of this thing, but I don't think you can avoid, I mean, you can avoid it in the overall proof because we are still controlling lower order gradients, high order gradients by lower order gradients, so, but it's just a convenience that we can just forget about this term. Okay. Okay, so anyway. Verify yourself. I mean, this is just multivariable calculus, and uh, uh, so I should at least write true things. And therefore, we do have the cancellation I claimed. So then, this is our this is our equality. We have this thing is bounded by this thing. You know? No. No. All right. And then this thing, the cofactor of this guy. I mean, the cofactor is just moving around the entries. Right? So then this thing is just like taking the, the, the norm squared of the gradient. Like this, yeah? This is just like taking the norm squared of the gradient. And then our uh, uh, cool inequality comes out because this thing here, right? It, uh, let's call that thing A. And A is bounding above the, by some constant, the integral of the U H 
h of phi squared dx. Yeah? Because that's what we established. That's the, the thing that we worked hard for, the determinant of a minus b bounds above constant. Yep, yep. So then what we have after we are, uh, divide through by, by this quantity is that the integral of the u h phi squared dx 1 over 2 is less than this thing. dx 1 over 2. Yeah? Because we're just dividing this thing on both sides. Yeah? And why does that make us very happy? Well, no, it, it does, but, um, but not quite yet. I mean, the, the, the point is that this thing is ugh, u of x plus h e m minus u of x over h. Yeah, this was our difference quotient we took. And since this is, since this is Lipschitz, this guy is, is uniformly bounded. Yeah, this is a uniformly bounded thing. So on the right-hand side, we have something that's uniformly bounded. On the left-hand side, we have that the difference quotients of the gradients are going to be uniformly bounded in L2 for all small h. Yeah? So then this thing is less than C for, or I could even be more explicit, but whatever, for all small h. So actually, happily, I, <laughs> I don't need the part that I didn't prove. Um, and this guy right here now forms a bounded sequence in Sobolov space. Yeah? Uh, uh, so we have that duh is bounded, which let's write it out, is this guy. is bounded in L2. Yeah? And just as, just as I kind of sketched, this thing being bounded in L2 means it'll have a weak limit, and that weak limit will be the gradient of the gradient. Yeah? Just by this moving the difference quotient on the test function trick that we did. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. So this implies that actually we have that the, the partial derivative in the nth direction of, of this guy actually has a gradient. Yeah. So it belongs to W12. Yeah. Uh, at least locally because we have some test function here. So locally in omega. Yeah. You with me? So what we've done is actually gain an entire gradient, right? We had something that was Lipschitz, so it has one gradient, and now with this argument, we've gained another gradient. Yeah? So M is arbitrary, so then that implies actually that U now belongs to W2, 2, locally, in omega. No? Cool. And just as you say, now passing to the limit, we have something that looks a lot like a Cacipoli uh, inequality, because when we pass the limit of this thing, we're going to have something which is the second derivative controlled by the first derivative. Yeah? Yeah? And even better, we can put some constant inside here uh, and, and uh, actually have that we have the average not just the function, but the function minus its average on a ball, if you wanted to. We'll get exactly the catchy poly inequality. Uh, but that's something I'll show you next time. But the moral is at this point that, let me just write down what we will get. 
we will get that we can do this on any bull. So on a bull, we're going to have that the second gradient of u squared dx 1 over 2 is going to be bounded by, so this thing, if we take a test function of ball of radius r, then since it has to go up to size 1, then this thing will have gradient of 1 over r, so that will be constant r to the minus 1, and then the integral of the ball of radius r of this thing. If you, and we could have stuck in some constant in this argument, and everything would have been cool. So this is the ball of radius r, uh, and it could be around any x. Like this. Ah, this is what we're going to get. Okay. And this is indeed uh, uh, exactly a catchy Pauli inequality. Right? We're controlling higher gradients by lower gradients. Yeah? And in the last case, when we were sketching how elliptic regularity allowed us to get better and better regularity, what we did was um, we said, OK, well, we can now just do the same thing again with the fact that if we have a higher gradient of the Laplacian, then it's still going to be the case that any partial of the Laplacian weakly solves the Laplacian and it will keep going, right? That's because Laplacian is linear. This is not linear. We don't have a linear situation. We can't do that trick here. We can't just say, okay, let's just repeat this argument. We had the right to do this one time yeah, because we had that the gradients belong to this nonlinear submanifold case. We have the right to apply this catchy poly inequality just one time. But anything about the gradient of the gradient, we can't, we can't start to say that. We can't start to say things about that yet. Um, uh, so what we need to do is to use another method to get better regularity. And what we're going to do is we're going to use these, this inequality to establish something called the reverse Holder inequality. So we're going to control this thing by a lower order power of this thing using the, using the Sobolov poincare inequality we proved last time. So it's going to turn out that we can bound this thing by the q x one over q. Uh, so in this inequality, I can average over the balls in both things like this. And then this is the reverse Holder inequality that we talked about last time. Uh, the, this is the poincare sobolev inequality that we talked about last time. Yeah? Um, this r to minus 1 is the right thing here. Yeah? So what we have here is a, a reverse, a reverse uh, Holder inequality because we have the right to choose Q uh, such such that we have the right to choose Q to be less than 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 this power two. So we should have one over two here because the improvement came from yeah that's where we're going except we'll get it right. So we will control this higher by this lower, and then there's a phenomenon called Gehring's lemma that says that. Um, that when we can do this, then we get an extra bump of integrability. Uh, uh, so we'll be able to show that the second gradient is a bit more than, than L2 integrable. It's going to be L2 plus epsilon integrable. And this is a, a, a key theorem in, in quasi-regular mappings. And once this thing is more than L2 integrable, then we know that actually the gradient will be holder by this part of sublog embedding thing we talked about before. And once the gradient is holder, then there's a way to iterate this and get more and more regularity. That's where we're going. All right, all right. So, any final questions? Sorry, I overrun, of course. Uh, any final questions before we say goodbye? All right, see you all Monday.
拜拜。